Best Book Bits podcast brings you Thomas Sterner, founder and CEO of the Practicing Mind Institute, in-demand speaker who works with high-performance individuals, including athletes, coaches, industry groups, CEOs, and individuals of all ages, freeing them to operate effectively within high-stress situations so they can break through to new levels of mastery. Author of the books, The Practicing Mind, Developing Focus and Discipline in Your Life, and the book, Fully Engaged, Using the Practicing Mind in Daily Life. Tom, thank you for being on the show. Thank you, Michael. It's great to be here. No worries. Now, for my audience who doesn't know who you are, take us back to being a musician in the early days and how, from sort of hating practice, you began sort of the journey and aware of that your undisciplined personality as a youth set you on a path and quest in your late teens to sort of determine and understand the nature of the disciplined mind, the elements of productivity, regardless of application and how you transformed them into your own weaknesses, into personal strengths. I know that's a lot to take in, but yeah, take us back to, to being a musician. Well, I was, uh, I was in, involved in music at a very young age. My father was a musician. My mother played the piano. My father played several instruments to, to a certain degree. Uh, he, however, was very undisciplined by his own admission. And so he only reached a certain level of musicianship. I actually started playing when I was about four. Um, and I had uh, one thing that became apparent was that I hated practicing, which is you know not uncommon. And most of that, which I didn't realize at the time, was because my focus, my interpretation of practice was not correct. And I didn't know that there was no one around me that knew that. And I started to see a behavioral pattern in myself where uh, I would start out with many things. It wasn't just um, the piano, but it could be gymnastics. It was a number of things that I was really interested in. They were all disciplines. And I would start out with an initial enthusiasm and I would burn through that enthusiasm fairly quickly. And then I was left with who I was, which was someone who was very undisciplined, but had a very creative mind. So by the time I got to be a senior in high school, I really came to the realization that I was never going to have any power if I couldn't pursue something that I had chosen to pursue, uh, whether that was a, a skill you know, or a task. Uh, and see it through. I wasn't in control of the process. So I realized that I had a problem that needed to be solved. I wasn't, I didn't have the faintest idea how to do that. I just had to recognize the fact that I, I had a problem that needed to be um, solved. And then when I got into college, uh, a real close friend of mine gave me a book that he had, uh, it was a textbook that he was going through in the philosophies of the world. And it, I, I really just devoured that book. It was hundreds of pages long, but I started studying about all the different Eastern thought, which I had never been exposed to before. And particularly Zen, you know, which was present momentness. And there was something about that that just rang so true to me that I began to put that practice into my life and things started to turn. And I began to see that my, the, the, what I was interpreting incorrectly, and this is, you know, at this point I had become, I had gotten back into music, I should say, in my late teens, and I was determined that I was not going to allow the weaknesses that had stopped me from becoming a good musician uh, um, impact where I was at this point in life. I was an adult at this point, and I, I really wanted to be a very good musician. I wanted to be able to uh, orchestrate and arrange and perform and songwrite and all those things. So once I began that path, I saw the, the old familiar things coming back. And that was at the same time, I was in college at that point, and that was at the time when I began reading about this stuff. And when I began to apply it, I realized that um, I had been obsessed with the, uh, the product. I had been obsessed with this uh, um, fictitious, ambiguous point in time where I was going to get to a place as a musician and I, or any artist really and feel like I had arrived and that now I'm as good as I need to be and everything would be, would be fine. And what I didn't realize was that, you know, if you look at when you first start a piano lesson, when you come into it, you know nothing about music and the teacher shows you these notes on a page and they show you the keys on a keyboard if you're taking piano. And you don't know any of them. You don't know what corresponds to what. And when you're there, that is your threshold. That's where your threshold is at that moment um, in your skill development, because everything in life is a skill. I don't care whether it's learning to walk or feed yourself or be in a relationship or build a business. 
it's always a skill and we start all skills from a place of no skill and then we move on this linear line of mastery and we have the opportunity to interpret that experience. We call that learning. So what is our interpretation of learning? And this was the difference in perspective that I began to have. I realized that I was at that threshold and in reality, we're always up against our threshold. That's the reason why we, we feel like we're struggling because we're always pushing against whatever our limit is. And when you begin to look at it like that, and what made this so clear to me, Michael, was because, you know, five years later, after I started, I was no longer trying to figure out where a note was on a page. I was playing much more complicated things, but I didn't feel inside. I didn't feel any better than I did that very first day in piano lessons. And that's because I was trying to play stuff that was up against my threshold. So I really kind of had this epiphany that, look, I'm always going to be in this place. I'm always going to be trying to play what I can't play. And um, so that feeling is just telling me, I'm in the process of mastering the next level. And so music was really a good place for me to, um, to for that to be an incubator, you know, for that. And then uh, in my later 20s, I began playing golf, which was, uh, then I became very involved in sports psychology and, and neuroscience and just all of those things. And I realized that we were really talking about two sides of the same coin and that the East, they had, had these practices that, by the way, we're now, we're now able to prove scientifically. In other words, uh, you know, we were really uncomfortable in a lot of Eastern thought stuff because, for one, we, we misinterpreted it as being t tied to religion, which it, it, it isn't. Um, it's, they make it part of their religions, but the actual science of it is not. Meditation and all these things, you know, here's a perfect example. Um, we, I, I saw a study where, you know, everybody's familiar with the, um, the vibrational states of the brain, the frequency states, you know, beta, theta, delta. Uh, they've heard these terms, even if they don't know what they mean. And they're just different levels that the brain operates at during the day in specific, uh, under specific circumstances. And, you know, now we have the equipment to actually measure that. And we can tell when somebody's brain is in a specific uh, frequency range. Well, the, the, um, one of the higher frequency ranges is gamma. And uh, what the scientists said that were studying this is that the average person's brain goes into gamma maybe for a second and a half, two seconds, several times during the day. But when they, so they brought in these monks that have, were normally meditating for hours and hours a day. And they looked at their brain waves and what was going on. And what they found was that they spent most of their time in gamma. Their brain is, is mostly in gamma, which the scientists said, we don't really even know what to make of that because it's so high functioning. Now, if you look at centuries that had gone by where the, the monks could say, yes, we are having all these experiences, but there was no way to validate any of that because it was all an internal conscious experience of the monks. There was no way for them to share that experience with somebody else. Now, because we can look at it and we have this, this, these instruments that can measure it and we can look at it and say, yeah, it, here it is, it's happening right now. And so now all of a sudden, something that used to sound like, you know, woo woo, uh, you know, new age thought is actually real science backed up by data. So that was, they were accumulating data that um, we didn't have instruments, you know, to, um, in order to measure that. So my point is that we know all this stuff now that we didn't know before. And in the East, or I'm sorry, in the West, we tend to be very results oriented. You know, we're taught from the beginning that we're incomplete, we need something outside of ourselves for that feeling to go away. And whatever it is, it's not where we are right now. So we have to learn how to make more money, to get a better relationship, to buy this car. If you just watch it, the, you know, the media and what is constantly bombarding us, it's always, you need this. You don't have this and you're not gonna be happy until you have this. The world is passing you by, life is passing you by because you don't have this. and. As soon as we get that, we just we get we just become attached to a new goal, <laughs> and the feeling is right back there again. So this is where, for me, music was where it started. Then, when I got into golf, it became 
my study of sports psychology and our Western sciences that let me see that, you know, we're, ta- we're all talking about the same thing. It's just a truth of how we operate. And, um, and, and actually, I find that very consoling, uh, you know, because it's, uh, it's normal for us. And we have what we know now is that we have this incredible potential with our mind that we're just beginning to be able to validate scientifically. Just because we haven't used it doesn't mean it's not there. It's just like, you know, electricity has always been here. It's just that, you know, you go back 500 years ago and you're talking about, you know, we have this electromagnetic force and we can do all these things with it. You know, you'd have no way of validating that or even showing it to somebody. And now we look at where we are with that. And it's the same thing with our mental abilities. We're really beginning to understand the relationship between the subconscious and the conscious and all those things and what our true potentials are. And it's, it's fascinating and it's really exciting. Yeah. Thank you for un- unpacking that, Tom. That was, that was really great. I do want to circle back to one thing. So in, in terms of your musician career, you're actually a, a chief concert piano technician uh, for major performing artists. Can you talk a little bit about that with your 25 years sort of tenure, sort of who were some of the big names that, that you worked with and what were some of the experiences that you learned from that? Well, that was a, another, but that was all happening at the same time. I became a piano technician. I was in college. I started studying piano technology outside of college. It was different from my uh, major when I was 19. And uh, because I love the piano so much and I was just naturally very mechanical, I just decided I finished the degree requirements for the college uh, major that I had. And then I just went over to the piano technology because I just enjoyed it so much more. And by the time I was 23, I had you know every credential that was offered and I began to get high level work. And then it just went from there. The reason that that was um, such a perfect job for me was number one, it's very solitudinal. You work by yourself all day long and you might be in the concert hall for hours with just a spotlight on the piano and in, in silence, you know, working. The other thing is that what people really cannot comprehend is how repetitious and monotonous piano work is. I mean, there are 88 notes. So everything you do, you have to do at least 88 times. And if you look at a grand piano action, there is, I don't I don't remember the exact number, maybe 5,000, close to 5,000 parts. There's about 34 adjustments per note. Each adjustment is interdependent on all each other adjustments. So if you change one adjustment, it's a chain reaction all the way down the line. So you have to go through the adjustment process multiple times to refine things because as i said you know each each thing you turn is going to affect something else uh, somewhere in the chain so you know it was that being by myself and having to face that every day and learn that like you know you could be like oh my gosh you know i've got to tune this piano there's 235 strings on it and i got to touch each one maybe a dozen times you know that's an awful lot and that's just one call for one day, you may be doing five to seven of those a day. So it's like I said, it's a very monotonous job and it requires a lot of concentration and uh, a very high attention to detail. So that created this opportunity because I was by myself to to work at um, how do I change this experience into something that instead of it feeling like drudgery that's never going to end into something that I wanted to do and that I was where I wanted to be. And that was all part of that learning that, you know, we spend our lives 98% of the time, we're in the process of achieving whatever it is that we want to achieve. And only about 2% of the time are we crossing the finishing line. And so we need, our focus needs to be on the process of achieving instead of the moment that we achieve something. And when we do that, when we, it's really a mental, it's just a mental shift. And when we make that mental shift, then we're just filled with this contentment and happiness and we're not impatient and we're not resisting the moment because we're where we are, we're where we want to be in this moment. When we're attached to a goal, like when I, whenever I get this piano finished, you know, then I can be done and I can go on to the next thing. Then what that does is it makes the present moment into this, um, your interpretation of that becomes, this is a, a nuisance or an inconvenience I have to endure so I can then get to this moment when I achieve the goal. And then this feeling inside of me, whatever it is, and boredom, impatience is going to be gone. When in fact, it, 
it never does because we just move from one thing to the other. And because our mindset and our paradigm is founded on this attachment to some point out in the future, not to where we are right now, we're always resisting this moment, which is a very uncomfortable place to be. In terms of who I met, you can pretty much, in the 1980s, 1990s, and through about 2012, you can pretty much name anybody, rock artist, classic uh, musician from all over the world, uh, country, western. I mean, I I met most of them. I sat in their green rooms and talked. After a while, you know, when I first started, it started happening. It was a big deal. They're just people. And, you know, like, and after a while, it's just like, um, you know, I would tell somebody I was in some big rock star's trailer sitting next to their favorite musician or you know girl singer or something and i'd just be working on their keyboards and uh, they would just be sitting there talking and they'd be like oh my gosh i can't believe that and i was like eh. you know it, it really just became kind of mundane you know after a while because i had a job to do and uh, and they were always very very nice to me uh, they appreciated my work so like i said they're very different off stage than they are the stage is just that's an act that they go through but when you meet them off stage they're they're just regular people they have their their kids are there and you know uh sometimes i'd be in the concert hall and there'd be like five-year-olds running around downstairs you know while their father was up stage on stage performing so yeah that's cool the only name that stuck out for me that was cool was pavarotti yes pavarotti a lot of classical musicians um i mean i worked on van Clyburn's piano i mean his personal piano you know like um that's you know these are these are people that were big but uh itzhak perlman yo yo ma i mean all you know all of those guys um uh like i said i actually have a list of it somewhere it's it's quite long you know um because of uh i didn't just do one theater i did multiple theaters and uh so you know um because of that i, I did accumulate over 25 years quite a bit of yeah, cool. I just want to go back really quick. I took some notes of what you were saying before. So you're talking about sort of 98% of the process is the process of achievement and only 2% is sort of the crossing the finishing line. You could probably say 98% of people are thinking about 2% of the finishing line and only 2% of people are actually focusing on the process of achievement. I sort of interpret it this way, which is sort of a lot of people interpret the present as a wall they need to overcome to reach the other side where you need to treat the present as a walk meaning it's it's always going it's very slow you know each second is the same time if that makes sense where people are sort of as you said putting that putting that interpreting as the present of something they need to overcome instead of something they need to go back to but we'll get into we'll get into the book when did the book come out the first one the practice in mind and, and what made you sort of write it as well well, I actually started I, to write the book in the early 90s. I, and I actually did write the book in the early 90s. And I was, of course, immersed in the piano technology. And I, I tried to find a publisher. Nobody wanted it um, because I, I was an unknown. The book was an unknown. Uh, it may have even been a little bit ahead of its time back then. I don't know. Uh, I eventually in a 2005 at that point i had a full-scale remanufacturing facility i was remanufacturing big grants and i had a lot of money tied up hundreds of thousands of dollars and uh i had uh, work that was um i had three and a half years of work scheduled out because there weren't very many people that did that kind of work so um i sold everything i decided look i really want to write this book and I saw I would just jumped off a cliff. I mean, I sold two business properties that had all the tooling. I sold the client base. I did, just walked away from all of it so that I could get the book out there. And at still at that point in 2005, nobody wanted it. So they, everybody, I was just like, you know, like bank credit. You can't get credit without a loan. You can't get a loan without credit. So I was being told, you know, you don't have an agent. Um, you need an agent or the publishers won't talk to you. Well, when I would talk to an agent, they would say, well, you don't have any books published, you know? So I ended up publishing the book myself. That's a long answer to that. And that was in 2005. And I wrote the book. I realized initially it was going to be just about, I, I had a lot of adults who were taking piano lessons. They had the money, they had the car, the house, the family, and they still felt unfulfilled, incomplete, as I said earlier. And they wanted to be part of something that was bigger than themselves, and they were looking for that. So they would buy a really nice piano, and then they'd start taking piano lessons, and they would run up against the same thing that their children did. You know, after they didn't want to practice, they'd start making excuses. 
And I saw that, you know, I, I felt like I could change that perspective if I just put it down in words. But then as I began writing the book, that was when I realized, you know, this is just about life in general. And then I shifted my focus, you know, to make the book really just more across the board. And so the first the first printing came out in 2005, and um, uh, it was a number of years later that I was approached by an agent uh, and said, I've read your book. looks like it's self-published. I'd really like to um, to represent you, and I think I can get you a contract uh, pretty quickly, which she did. So then, then the version is out there now, which was – it's just more the the publishing company did not want me to take anything out. They just wanted me to add more. So the book was, uh, in, I just added more material to it. Uh, so that was how the book got there, and that was how it started. Um, and, but, you know, the, it really, it looked like it was the dumbest thing I could have ever done because initially I was hemorrhaging money. You know, I was making very good money in the piano business. I had been in it for long enough that I, I had a very established reputation. I didn't have any competition. And... Well, when I first published the book, I think I was making about 30 bucks a week uh, on sales, you know, and I thought, this is not a good situation. And everybody that said that's the dumbest thing you can do is going to be telling I, telling me I told you so. But, you know, the book just, um, I just hung in there, which is a really good point to make. Um, in in Fully Engaged, there's a chapter called make, Creating Your Goals with Accurate Data. If somebody had told me, Look, it's going to take about two years for this to mature. At six months, I wouldn't have been upset, you know. But because I didn't know that, what we always do is we make these goals to ourselves, and we when we make a goal, we attach a time frame to it, and generally without any real information. And so, I, and an analogy that w really drives this home is if I said, I, I want to lose. I want to lose 30 pounds. Huh, let me see. That ought to take me about six days. Well, we can look at that and go, that's about the most ridiculous thing. But if you didn't know that, then what would happen is you'd say, I'm going to start eating right. I'm going to start exercising. And, you know, four days into it, you've lost maybe two pounds. And you're thinking, like, I'm not good at this. Uh, I can't accomplish my goals. You start, uh, your confidence drops away. And you start being hard on yourself when you actually may be doing very well. And, so that was what, you know, happened with that. You know, like, I really didn't have any idea. But I, the book on its own, it just kept marching forward. In fact, it's still, it's been out for that many years. It's still upward trending. It's really, it's in all kinds, it's, I think, 12 or 13 languages now. Um, uh, and, 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 and continues to do well. I have letters from people from all over the world. It's really been an unbelievable and fantastic experience for me. Uh, but like as I said, initially it didn't. It looked like a big. It looked like a real mistake, you know, uh, when I started out because it looked like it was not going to have a happy ending. I thought I'm going to crash and burn financially, you know, with this. So, um, but it. But again, I, that was because I had, I didn't have enough information to know, to give myself the time to do that. Another example of that is when I was a musician. I wanted to play this. I was studying jazz, and I wanted to play this particular jazz run on the piano. So I began practicing it, and uh, I practiced it for 15, 20 minutes a day as part of my daily practice, and I did that for uh, about 10 days, and I couldn't play it. And so I really began to think, uh, I was probably 22 at the time, I began to think that, well, you know, maybe... I just don't have the ability to play this. Like I see other people can do this, but maybe I just can't play this fast. And so I quit. And about a month later, um, I was on a, a gig playing, and it was my turn to solo. And I was soloing. I don't know what possessed me, but I decided to just try the run, and it just it was effortless. And I did not understand how that could possibly have been. Well, I later learned on that, learned that, you know, it takes the brain so long, so many repetitions to create the synapses and just the whole, all the electrical pathways that have to happen for that particular motor coordination to come out. And I didn't give it long enough. Like if I had just, if somebody had said, uh, if I had said to somebody, I, I've been doing this for two weeks and I can't play it. And they said, well, you shouldn't be able to play it in two weeks. You know, you won't be able to play it for three and a half weeks. You know, then you'll be able to play it. Then all of that pressure on myself would have dropped away and I would have been perfectly comfortable just going through it with no expectations at all. It's a very important point.
Yeah, it's uh, an analogy that I got from that. Like my uh, my young kids were in swimming, and my son is um, outperforming his class, but he doesn't know what he's doing. We take him to swimming once or twice a week, and he's getting better and better. And over the years, he's now he's at a stage where he's loving the process that much. So. Segwaying this into your book, The Practice in Mind, some of the notes I got from it in one packet. You talk about sort of top performers in any field. They're the best, and, and the reason they are the best is because they've mastered the secrets of thought awareness and learned to enjoy the process of a practice in mind. Can you expand on that with, you know, enjoying the process, mastering thought awareness, and, and what's that all about? Well, the very fundamental, the very first thing that you have to do with any self-improvement, with any self-expansion or transformation is you have to experience that um, I am not my thoughts and I am not my behaviors. I have thoughts. Some of those thoughts I actually do create, but most of the thoughts, the, what neuroscience says is about 95% of them are programs that have been installed into our subconscious. And this starts from the day we're born. And many of those those programs, we've installed ourselves. Well, we've installed all of them, but it's been through our reactions sometimes from what other people have said uh, to us. And when you understand the subconscious, you know the subconscious mind is literally 10 million times faster than the conscious mind is. And there's a reason for that. Uh, if we start to fall, uh, our subconscious mind kicks in and it works our balance system and tries to keep us from falling. You know, if we had to consciously think, do this with your right foot, bend your ankle this way, you know, move your knee this way, we couldn't, we would never be able to keep up with it. So the subconscious mind is much faster than the conscious mind. And what it is, is it's an eloquent it's a very elegant recorder. It, it's very accurate and it records what, what it's observing and it's always observing. It's observing what we feel and what we think. So what, and I, here's an analogy for you. I was having this discussion with a client one time and he was an executive and he said, I don't buy that. I think that I am thinking my thoughts all the time and so I said to him, to make a point, obviously I wasn't being serious, I said, um, well, I think what you need to do is realize that I'm the coach and you're the, the student here, so you need to just shut your mouth until I tell you to talk. And as soon as I did that, he had a very predictable reaction. And I said, did you choose to have that reaction? And he said, thank you for the awakening. <laughs> like, um, I said, you see, that was a response that you have stored into your subconscious and so your subconscious is watching and when I changed my tone it said it looked on the hard drive and said what are we supposed to do when somebody talks to us like this we do this and this is really powerful because what it says to us is that if we're if we're in control of that we can control how we react in situations by doing our own programming. But if we're not even aware that is going on, then we're always installing programming that usually, and then what the neuroscience says is about 95% of the time, we're just running programs. We're basically, things are happening out here, our eyes are seeing it, our ears are hearing it, and it's stimulus, and the stimulus the subconscious sees the stimulus and says this is what he wants she wants this is it's giving us what it thinks that we want it, it doesn't think at all it doesn't have a sense of humor it doesn't evaluate it's just uh, you know this is the this is the stimulus this is the response that our owner has told us that we're supposed to give now um you know we're using words like our conscious or subconscious you know they're all just different aspects of one entity. But you know, the subconscious is necessary and it, um, it really is, we, that's the reason, the reason it's so, it, it, we go into it when we're in fight or flight is because it's so much faster. The problem with it is there's no conscious choice making in it. It just, it doesn't evaluate, it just puts the stuff out there. It doesn't say, I know that when I give him this thought, it makes him feel lousy, but uh, it's what I'm supposed to give them. So maybe I can tweak it a little bit. It doesn't do that. It just, you, you say something or you think something uh, and it just reacts to that. So it's a very, it's very important that we understand that that is how, that's how the, the interaction works. And 
I'm not sure. Did that answer your question? Yeah, it did. I could probably give a, a good analogy. I like what you said when uh, you were coaching the client and you changed the tonality. Reminds me of the Chris Rock and uh, Will Smith thing. So Chris Rock said a joke about Will Smith's wife. They all thought it was, Will thought it was funny until he looked at his wife and she had a disapproval look. And then he went into that unconscious reaction mode where another guy has insulted my wife. So straight away got up, went up, smacked him. You know, that that was a total unconscious moment, whether that's staged or not. But it was a good analogy of what happens when someone triggers you and you you react so fast and so strong, high emotions where, yeah, so that sort of reminded me of that. So thank you for sort of sharing that as well. Another thing in the book you, you talk about, it's got to be more than the results. So it's got to be more about, you know, we've got to stop thinking about the end product, you know, money, accolades, et cetera, that actually drive us. You said to perform at a very top level, you have to be the results before you get there. Can yeah, you have to, you know, a lot of this is really is a shift in thinking because the way you think is a conditioned response. But you were talking about uh, earlier, we were talking about, you know, uh, crossing the finish line. And one th analogy I would use there is that why does it feel good when you cross the finish line? It's because of everything that has happened before that. If I just take a piece of chalk and I draw a line in the street and I say, there's the finish line, go ahead and step over it. It doesn't mean anything. What makes it mean something? It's because of everything that you have done in the, in the process of getting to there. It's the pre pre preparation and, and then the running the race and pushing yourself. Even when you're tired, you're pushing yourself more. And that is being the result you know that is like um when you are you have to think you know the, this is another thing about neurosciences you know that they're learning is that um what makes things happen is this feeling of it's already done it's it's already happened you know that's what you're programming you know you you programmed and i've already i've already fin i've already won the tournament i've already finished the race you know um first and this is why you're seeing in sports psychology like uh you know because i was so involved in golf you see things like, um, like a golfer will sit in a, in a chair, close his eyes, and play an entire tournament in their mind, because the subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between something that is happening outside and something that is happening internal. They found this out, and I think it was in the 1970s, then when they were studying Olympic athletes, and they found out when, when they would envision a certain thing happening, uh, say in their routine the same areas of the brain would, would react as when they were actually physically doing it and the same muscles would twitch. And so from the mind's perspective, there was no difference between when it was um, really happening, let's say really happening, uh, which would just be outside and when it was happening internally. And there's another side to this that's very important. And that is that, uh, that I tell people, you know, if you, when you worry about something, uh, my daughter came home when this is when she was a little girl. She came home one day. It was like 430 in the afternoon and she was upset. And I said, what, you know, what's the problem? And she said, well, this girl told me in my locker, she didn't like my hair, you know? And I said, well, when did that happen? And she said, oh, this morning. I said, you mean like at eight o'clock this morning? And she said, yeah. And I said, it's 430 in the afternoon and you are reliving that over and over again. And every time you replay that thought in your mind, your blood chemistry changes, your, the same hormones gets flooded your body. Your body doesn't know the difference between it happening at eight o'clock this morning and it happening at 4.30. It's the, the wear and tear, in other words, is still happening on you. And so this is the reason why, because I want to talk about thought awareness, um, that this concept of um, I am not my thoughts, you have to learn the experience of watching your thoughts, of being the observer of your thoughts, because that's when you notice the programming that's going on. When you become the observer of your thoughts, that's when you're anchored in who you really are, because you're not your thoughts. They come afterwards. You are the, per the, the being that is watching the thoughts. And when you get to that point, that's when you get you let yourself out of the prison because at that point you have the privilege of choice is you know one of the things i ask people you know this is in my the book that i'm working on right now is if you 
could finish this thought right now, would you? In other words, if you could not have this thought anymore, that whatever thought you're having in this moment, if you could stop that thought, would you choose to do that? Um, and, and the reason is because for most people the answer is, yeah, I would like to do it, but I can't do it. I mean, that's something that I have found with um, when I'm teaching uh, people how to meditate. I've worked with high school kids, and when you um, tell them, we do like a two-minute exercise, and I just say, look, I'm gonna, you're going to close your eyes for two minutes. I want you to stop thinking. Oh, I, I know they can't do it. You know, they don't know they can't do it, but I know they can't do it. So I set a timer, and when they come out of this thing, they're like, totally stunned and perplexed and they they immediately start jabbering about oh i was telling myself to not think and but i was down in the cafeteria and i was thinking about something somebody said to me yesterday and on and on and i say well there's something that you really have to look at here if you are telling with your will you're telling your mind stop thinking and your mind is saying no i'm going to think and there's nothing you can do about it I, who's really in control of what's going on in your day and in your life and for a lot of people, this is the first time that they've really realized that, that the mind is a, you know, it's a problem-solving machine. If you don't give it, if it loves a problem, and if you don't give it a problem, it just goes into search mode, and it'll just start looking for something. And um, most people just go along for the ride. Um, and what it does is it has a thought, and that thought garners a response from the subconscious which puts that out there and that response begats another thought and it just keeps going and so what's important what thought awareness is is a very simple process it's a very simple meditation process to teach you that um to that to feel that separation of i you know right now my mind is thinking but i'm not my mind I'm, I use my mind, but I don't allow my mind to use me. And they're two different places. And that you really have to get there to be able to accomplish anything because I'm feeling impatient. People go, how do I get more patient? Well, the first thing is you have to recognize the difference between being impatient and having an impatient thought. They're two different places. And when you can learn what it feels like to notice that you're having an impatient thought, now you have the opportunity to make a choice to change that thought. If you don't, you're just going to feel impatient. And uh, so th it's this is what that is what thought awareness is about. Yeah, thanks for unpacking that. And one of the notes I got from that was sort of anchor your being and sort of get out of that prison. You talk about sort of enjoying the practice and, and learn to enjoy being mindful. My wife refers to me as the, as the tortoise and she's the hare. I'm very, very slow. I take the long way, but I don't stop. And the reason, like, I've got a, a longer time frame where I can work all day. Like, I've been up since 3.30 this morning. I'll go to bed at sort of 9.30, and I won't stop working per se. I won't stop doing things, but I'm doing it in such a slow, meditative state that it doesn't look like I'm doing anything. But looking back, I've actually done uh, a hell of a lot of stuff because I'm actually more focused on the present moment in the process and not worried about the end goal or the end product or what do I need to achieve? So I'm always focused on state first, especially mental state. And I want to go back earlier to what you're talking about with the, the your brain frequencies and things like that too, which is it's so important. Understanding different times of the day, you're gonna have different. You're gonna be in a different state of frequency. And when you understand the pace of not only your day-to-day -day life, but your brain activity as well, you can actually chunk certain activities at certain parts of the day where you're actually either be concentrating, resting, high-performance activity too. So I'm not sure if you want to unpack a little bit about that. So just in a nutshell, enjoying the practice, learn to enjoy being mindful and sort of the, the understanding of what state you're in during the day and how you can use that to your advantage as well. Is there anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, I think that... Um you know we we touched on it earlier you know when you are when you're feeling like i don't want to be where i'm at that's because you're feeling like you want to be someplace else and that's that creates this sense of resistance when you can you know surrender to i want to be where my feet are you know i want to be right here doing what i'm doing uh it's really fascinating to watch because i i see this with people that i work with you know it's a, such a simple shift in um, what your goal is. When your goal is to be here doing what you're doing, then all of a sudden your experience, your interpretation of 
what am I doing right now changes. It's not that the this whatever you're doing is just whatever you're doing. You have a choice as to how you experience whatever you're doing. And when you change your interpretation, when you say, well, I'm where I want to be, then you have a, you're, you're being successful because you're here doing what you're, you want to do. But when you're feeling like I'm not going to be happy until I get to this place over here, then you begin to, as we said earlier, resist this moment because it's in the way of you getting to be someplace else. But in general, we're, we're doing what we have to do in this moment, whether it's taking the kids to school or, um, you know, or work or whatever is we're, we're where we have to be. So we need to learn to change what that experience is so that we spend more of our time in a state of contentment instead of in a state of feeling like um, I don't want to be here. Uh, and I think that one of the reasons this is difficult and this these states of mind impact our brain frequency you know like when you change your state of mind it changes your brain frequency so um because they can look at their the brain is at different frequencies when you're happy and when you're sad there's different areas of the brain that are operating in different frequencies that are happening but i think that you know one of the things that's important is to realize that um when we look at this in the western world um we have a problem with things that are infinite, meaning um, when I tell people, look, I want you to do this simple meditation, and it takes 10 minutes a day, and I want you to do that every day. And I said, you know, what you, what you find is that they're really good for about the first week, and then they start sliding, and then they just start to go back into the previous behaviors. And, and one of the, I feel like what happens there is Meditation, whatever, that's just a word. It's a label. You can, I call it thought awareness training um, because I think it's easier because that's what we're doing. But I think that it's, what's important about it is to realize, look, we have so much on our plate. You, you mentioned that. We have so much going on that we want closure. We, we want the kids picked up. We want the report done at work. We want this meeting over with, this interview done. We want all these things done so that we feel like, well, I've closed that. I can take it off my plate. Now I can focus on this. Even though that just can, is a continuum because there's always something that falls in to replace it whenever we finish it. And because of that, we struggle with the concept of something like, you're telling me I have to meditate? 10 minutes a day for the rest of my life that that's just like that feels so overwhelming even though it's only 10 minutes a day but we brush our teeth every day <laughs> we, you know we do lots of things every day we exercise you know we never get to a point in exercising where we say well i'm 35 i'm done exercising you know like I, i've gotten there so i don't need to exercise at all anymore we just accept the fact that this is part of a healthy life and in this world today, what we're finding is because of the constant overstimulation of the brain that we have been asking the brain to move at a faster rate and the brain is evolving to do that. But what, the, what is atrophying in the brain is the ability to pay attention for any length of time and to remember for any length of time. You know, our working memories are deteriorating and that's because that's not what we're asking our mind to do. We're asking our brain to operate faster, 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 process more data, more data, more data. And, uh, you know, I look at it like uh, if you go back to before the printing press was invented, there were no books. I mean, people didn't, only with the exception of some religious texts and things like that, but the general public didn't have reading skills because they didn't need them. And then there was this paradigm shift when, the, um, when books became available through the Gutenberg press and all, books were being out there and all of a sudden people needed to learn how to read now if you think about that what does that mean well before then they just told stories now they had to learn to put symbols together and phonetics together to form words and a sentence and then have a visual their brain had to figure out how to have a visual from this sentence instead of just listening to someone talk it had to read and so the brain had to evolve to do that. Well, it didn't, you know, over a short period of time, I don't know, several decades or whatever, the brain became really good at that. Now it's atrophying because people don't have to read because they can watch a video. Like, um, you know, kids don't have to use their imagination because there's a video for it. And so we're asking our brain to do something different and not do this anymore. And so that skill is going away and that's why this short thought, you know, 10 minutes of meditation day is so important because it holds on to that skill and it develops, 
It continually refreshes that skill of being able to pull your mind in and say, I need to pay attention to this right now for the next hour. And it allows you to do that. Most people, you know, there's a book out by Nicholas Carr years ago about what the Internet is doing to our brain. And it, you know, he talked about how he thought he had, I think he called it middle-aged brain rot. He said, I used to read voraciously. He said, then I found that as I was getting older, I could only read for maybe eight to ten minutes at a time. And then I would think, like, i got to go check my email. Or, you know, it, it was just like this constant resistance to it and pushing away. And that's what we're... That's coming from the, what his research showed was that that's coming from this constant overstimulation and us asking our brain to function in a new way, and we're not asking it to hold on to the old way, and it's very important that we do. Yeah, I could sum that up in uh, in the book. You talk about sort of the four S words, which is sort of simplify, which is basically w when you work at specific projects or activity, simplify it by breaking it down into you know uh, component uh, sections. You talk about small as well. Be aware of our overall goal. Remember, it's use it as a rudder or, or distant beacon that, that keeps you on course, but break the overall goal into small, simple sort of sections that can be achieved in a comfortable amount of concentration, which, which you just talked about there. Also short, you have to simplify the task, breaking it down into smaller segments and asking yourself to focus on, you know, only a shorter period of time. And then the last one is slow, which I, I spoke about before, and that's inc incorporating slowness into the into your process. You know, it's a bit of a paradox because we're in such a, a fast-paced world. So, yeah, simplify small, short, and, and slow. Yeah, I think we're running over time. So, Tom, I just want to say, yeah, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for... The, the books that you've done we haven't jumped into the other one and you you mentioned about you're writing another book is that correct is there sort of the trilogy coming out yeah yeah that's the third book and it'll, it'll be out in january of next year and that really is a summary of where we are from a scientific standpoint you know what we know about how this the conscious and the subconscious interact and um and how to become more of a deliberate thinker, you know, um, so that uh, you're in control and how to use your subconscious mind instead of being used by it. You know, I mean, we, we always have control. We just don't know it and we don't use it. So um, this is some of the things that, like I said, th what we're talking about now, if you, uh, Michael, if you just look at the word meditation, you know, you go back 30 years ago and that word was like, you were either a hippie, you know, or a Tibetan monk. And now you have major corporations with meditation rooms and they're teaching it in school and they realize that it normalizes your blood pressure and all this you know all these different things that are very healthy and it's just nobody bats an eye when you bring it up well that's what is going to be that's where we're going to be with this stuff here uh this is what's coming out is that people are going to realize um why do i do the things that i do why do i do things that make me unhappy um, how do I change how I react to situations? All those types of things. We have the science. And I, you know, just to end this, I'll tell you that I think that what I tell people is if you go back, if you just look at flight, um, you know, for thousands of years, we wanted to fly. And we tried. And the good people, educated people, smart people, uh, hardworking people, and they all failed and some of them died. And the reason was not because we were incapable of flight, it was because we didn't understand something called the Bernoulli Principle. The Bernoulli Principle basically is how a wing or a sail on a sailboat creates lift. And once we understood that, within several decades, after thousands of years, we had airplanes that were flying over 400 miles an hour and at 25,000 feet. So this is, this is where we are with this stuff. This is, you know, we really understand now and it's just exploding, you know, how the mind works, what our relationship is, what, what conscious studies and, you know, science, consciousness, science, all that stuff, you know, uh, and it's fascinating, but it's going to be very empowering to people and people need to take an interest in this because the world needs for us to be in control of our energy and our thoughts. Um, just like the example you gave earlier of the, uh, you know, the, uh, Will Smith, you know, uh, I'm sure if he had it to do over again, he would have handled it differently. Like, you know, like, um, so, you know, my point is, is that this is, this is all stuff to me that is, it's, um, it's exciting because it's being, being proven by data that we can look at and we're in the West, we're just more comfortable, you know, and we can see that.
Well, definitely, yeah. When that comes out, I'll definitely uh, get you back on the show and, and talk about that new book. Wonderful. Love it. So, yeah, Tom, thanks for coming on the show. To my audience, go out there. Yeah, read Tom's stuff, find him online, and check out his website as well. And, again, Tom, thank you for your time, and thanks for being a guest on the Best Book with Podcast. And, yeah, we'll speak to you next year when the new book comes out. Okay. That sounds fantastic, Michael. Thank you so much for having me.